I'm thrilled to be presenting my first state of the school. It's really the first state of our school um, to summarize some of the high points and some of the challenges in the past year and some of the exciting opportunities going forward. A school is, is really about its people. So I want to start by just a couple of moments of silence to recognize those that have been part of our community, particularly faculty and students that have passed away in the last year. This by no means represents everybody, but I think it does give us an opportunity. So just a few moments of silence. Okay, so I'm starting um, really where I started last year. Uh, it was about a year ago that I took over the helm. Uh, Dean Andrews uh, decided to take a vacation at the end of June, so I took over two weeks early, and I'm going to count that in my exit <laughs> when, I, when I leave two weeks early. But anyway, I had, I had two guiding principles um, that I really try to keep reminding myself of. The first is the true belief that uh, if we leverage the concept of one Duke, that is, if we can, can take all parts of Duke, not only the School of Medicine, but the university, the health system, the PDC, and really work together, we can be something that is quite unique and maximize our effectiveness and impact. And the, the second is service. I really believe the, the reason to serve as a leader is to serve those that are in your community. And our success, my success, the Dean's Office success will really be by facilitating all of your successes. That we have such incredible faculty, staff, trainees, and students. If we figure out how to support you and strategize with you, that again is the key to our success. So one thing I've learned, people ask, well, any surprises about being Dean? Um, yes, it's big, it's complex, and a lot of agendas. Um, and I'm going to try to cover most of it, but I am sure there are things that I will forget and people that I'll forget. And I just want to apologize right up front, but it's not my fault. It is not my fault. We're so complex. I also want to thank Jill Boy because she had the, she had the job of pulling together all the different parts of Duke as we were kind of thinking about what we were going to talk about today. And that is no small task. So first of all, let's start with new leadership besides myself. Um, Adrian Hernandez started soon after me as the Vice Dean for Clinical Research. Um, Mike Pensina is probably the latest on our team. We started, uh, when I started, we were looking at how to better organize, uh, the, particularly IT and data science, particularly with our campus partners in OIT and DHTS to really maximize our academic agenda. And part of that planning process, we decided we needed a leader. So Michael is the Vice Dean for Data Science and Information Technology. Tom Kaufman at Duke NUS did a search for a new Vice Dean for Education. And he was very fortunate to get Ian Kern. He's a Harvard Macy Scholar in Education, has a very long history of, of innovation education. And we're going to do things in collaboration with Ian. And then Gita Swamy was appointed Senior Associate Dean for Regulatory Oversight and Research Initiatives in Clinical Research. So other senior leadership. Brenda Armstrong, after many, many years of the incredible leadership of the, the admissions process in the medical school, became a senior associate dean for student diversity, recruitment, and retention. Stacy Palmer, um, I borrowed her in our One Duke concept from the health system to be the associate dean for strategic planning and chief of staff. Shresh Balu was asso is associate dean for innovation and partnership. And Kathleen Cullen Emmerich assumed the role as associate dean for research mentoring. New chairs are always the, the uh, lifeblood of our academic organization. And so we had three new chairs. Um, I know you think Leslie's been a chair for a while, but actually she became the chair of the new Department of Population Health Sciences this year. Anthony Vera, we, we recruited successfully to be the new chair of Community and Family Medicine. And our latest new chair, Kathleen Cooney, has not joined us yet. She'll be starting 1st of August as chair of medicine. Other new Duke leaders, um, Tom Owens uh, became the president of Duke Hospital, taking over from Kevin Sowers this spring. John Sampson became president of the PDC. And Chris Plow became our new director of the Global Health Institute. So faculty honors. This is where I'm saying sampling. 
there is no way I can reflect all of the honors that all of our, our faculty get both internally and externally. But I want to give you a sampling so you can get an idea of the success, both junior and senior faculty. So first, the Physician Strong Start Awards. This is a partnership um, originally funded by the Duke Endowment where junior faculty are, compete for funds to really facilitate their initiation of their research programs. And we have great representation across a number of departments. By the way, I'm not going to read everybody's name because I will never, ever get done. And truth be told, I don't pronounce everybody's name properly. So this is a great way to avoid that. Um, on the more senior uh, side of success, we had five faculty that, that got the highest honors, which is becoming distinguished professorships at the university level. Now, our faculty are recognized uh, around the world for their successes and their leadership, and I'm just going through some of what I think are the, are the more uh, prestigious recognitions, again, representing the breadth and strength of our faculty. Please read them, look at their pictures, because I don't have time to go through everybody. And what you'll see as you go through the recognition of our faculty is, again, it's both junior and senior faculty. This is some of the more junior faculty recognized outside of Duke um, with major awards. OK, so let's talk about major initiatives. Um, when I started, uh, Chancellor Washington had uh, launched what he called Translating Duke Health Initiative. These are multi-year, multidisciplinary programs that are meant to bring teams of scientists together. Not only teams across institutes and departments, but teams that are comprised of basic scientists all the way to implementation scientists. So real communities of scientists um, convening around five major areas, cardiovascular, children's health, neuroscience, cancer, immunology, and transplantation. And the idea is you take on some big challenges. For instance, Alzheimer's. Well, what is the underpinning of dementia? Um, in children's health, it's really the concept of understanding very early life um, environment, genetics, uh, and how that might predict later health. So each one has a focus. Cancer, the focus is really understanding uh, brain metastases by studying both the primary tumor and the metastatic tumor. So these are well now on their way. They have already awarded about 14 grants internally. Many more RFAs are going out. A common message I'll give you today is keep your eyes open. There are so many opportunities for seed funding of new ideas within Duke. Um, the one thing that always disappointed me as a chair and will continue to disappoint me as a dean is when I hear I didn't know. I didn't know there was that opportunity. Well, translating Duke health initiatives are opportunities. There are opportunities for internal funding. The idea is, a, is you bring something forward, and eventually that will become something that's sustainable with external funding. These are also platforms to do great partnership recruits. So when I started, I think I mentioned that I'm not going, I'm not going to do away with the partnership recruit process that Dean Andrews started. But there are different ways to organize partnership recruits. And the TDH initiative has been a great way to get departments, institutes, and now the TDH um, organizations to work together to find scientists that can really be part of that team, fill in gaps as we think about the challenges going forward. And then there have been 14 symposia held, and these have probably been the most active part of TDHs this year. And those are opportunities when the community of scientists have gotten together, kind of talked about the disease at hand from many, many different perspectives. And it's, a, it's amazing how much sort of cross-fertilization happens when you have a basic scientist in a room with a clinical scientist, and they really start talking. So I think these, these are really starting to mature. Um, just to remind you, each of the TDH initiative has a convener. And I use the word convener because they are really thought to bring the community of scientists together, but not to make unilateral decisions. And so I really encourage everybody to participate um, in the, the TDH um, conversations going forward. Another new initiative that started right before I became dean um, was the su successful recruiting of Rob Califf back and the launching of a new health data science center, um, which they called the Duke Forge. This again is a one Duke cross campus model where the leadership team really draws very, very broadly. The idea is you convene these teams around projects. The projects initially are really focused on delivering improvements to patients and providers. So using big data 
to solve some of our more complex problems. They are engaged uh, faculty from the cl clinical and quantitative departments to date will be expanded to include basic science challenges as well. Um, the CTSI and CTSA grant that went in successfully, thank you, Ebony, um, will also have a data science core that will work um, with FORGE as new projects come through the system. The, the concept is FORGE is kind of an umbrella, but it's not all bells and whistles within FORGE, that, that Rob is really connecting to different parts of the institution rather than recreating silos. And so one of the parts of the institution is connecting with the science accelerator um, which Eric Wong is leading within the dean's office to really develop some of the data science uh, technology that's needed to complete these projects. And it's also got an education mission, so the second cohort of mentored masters, doctoral and postdoctoral scholars are moving through. So I would say FORGE is well on its way to become really an established entity within our One Duke community. Now what about population health? Um, population health has an academic component, which is really represented by the Department of uh, Population Health Science, uh, which, as I said, Leslie is the chair. Um, it has a translational component, the Center for Population and Com Community Health Improvement that Ebony leads. And then there is a operational and management component as we manage the population of of individuals that we are responsible for, and Dev Sangvai leads that, leads that in the Population Health Management Office. All of this came together this year for the first Duke Population Health Symposium, um, which I thought was a tremendous success. So we really are developing the science and the application of population health at Duke. Okay, so let's go through our research agenda, which is, again, big. Um, and again, I'm only doing sampling, so you get a flavor of, of really where we're going. First of all, this is sampling of major clinical research grants. This shows depth and breadth. First of all, in terms of our funding agencies, we continue to, continue to do very well with NIH funding, but a lot of great funding from industry and also from foundations. So looking at what Miang Yant bought here when we recruited her as part of the global health recruitment, um, she brings a very large grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation with looking at malaria in Myanmar. So you can see, just kind of scroll down, all those different projects really with significant impact. Same true for basic science. Again, although NIH is our largest funder for basic science, um, look at the diversity of areas of research that we are successfully getting funding in. And again, if you look at the specific titles, you will understand the impact of the work that's being done in the basic science departments. So I mentioned the CTSA was successfully funded, so we're on version three. That is no small feat, and I'm very appreciative of Ebony having taken that role when Rob went to the uh, FDA a little over two and a half years ago. So the new CTSA, a lot of information will be coming about that. There's several newly funded programs. Um, I think one of the newest is the community engagement piece. Ebony, would that be true? But also ex expansion of bi biostatistics, new informatics. So lots of new elements. Keep your eyes open. The National Clinical Clinician Scholars Program sits within CTSA. That's essentially the new version of Robert Wood Johnson Scholars. And we were invited into a very prestigious group. It's, uh, it's a an opportunity that we had to pay for uh, because they really want to see institutional investment and very appreciative of the health system who really partnered with the School of Medicine to become a National Clinician Scholars Program. I think one of the strongest aspects of the new CTSA is a real invigorated partnership with NCCU. I had the pleasure of going over with Ebony to visit our colleagues there, and this is going to be really exciting. And then, of course, the KL2 program, the TL1 scholarships. So a lot going on within the new CTSA. Again, keep your eyes open. But just to sort of reflect on CTSA impact, these, these are numbers that reflect the impact of the, three, the two versions of CTSA. And I think the third version will probably double all this. But you can see it's a catalyst for training, for sure. It brings. Um, development dollars for new projects, it actually seeds follow-up funding quite significantly. 
Um, there's even been a number of new companies created as a result of some of the investment within CTSA. So this is a very important framework that fuels translational and clinical science at Duke. Okay, we had a physician scientist development trifecta this spring. Um, as I go through our strategic planning process in a little bit, you'll see that one of the areas we're really focused on is how to really um, expand the physician scientist pipeline. You know that is part of a national conversation. The numbers have been dwindling. So um, there are a couple of grant opportunities, and we were tremendously successful. First of all, this is a team effort. As you see in the bottom of this slide, there are a number of faculty from a number of clinical departments that really collaborated together on getting this funding. The, the first was the Burroughs Welcome Fund Physician Scientist Institutional Award. This is for non-dual degree, so, so MD scientists. Um, we are one of five recipients, and I can tell you every top program in the country competed for this. A lot of uh, resources and some institutional resources as well. But really to address the training gaps and issues in the single degree physician scientist pipeline, particularly as they go through their clinical training and how do you keep them engaged? And how do you train them? The second was a uh, new NIH um, opportunity. Or these are called STAR Awards or Stimulating Access to Research During Residency, R38 Awards. I understand there were 10 given in the country. We got two of them. That's not a bad track record. Um, and again, th this is actually both MD, PhD, as well as MD physician scientists, but to support research conducted by resident investigators, because we know that very often we lose that focus during clinical training. And then Sally Permar, I don't know if Sally's here. I call this the trifecta because she, oh, there's Sally. She, she was named. Um, to lead the NICHD-sponsored Pediatric Scientist Development Program, very prestigious national program in physician scientists. So this will all come under an umbrella in the dean's office, an associate dean for physician scientist development. This means we are serious. We are serious about encouraging the career path and supporting the career path through the many phases of a physician's development and career. Okay, little sampling of publications. Now, these are not the titles that are on these papers, but this is how the lay press saw these papers. Um, you can see sex cells, um, because we have two of the six that were highly cited were about sex of microorganisms, so go figure. Um, but it, this reflects not only the quality of research, all in top journals, but again, the breadth of research and the potential impact. So, you know, Everybody wonders why facial and head pain hurt so much, right? I always wonder that. And it always seems like when you get uh, particularly a tooth out, it's excruciating. We're looking at that. What about really understanding how depression affects the wiring in the brain? An amazing application of artificial intelligence. Thermal control of sex determination. I don't know if I can apply that one too much. But um, you can see that this is an amazing list and just a sampling of the types of uh, science being done. Also in the clinical arena as well. Now I did pull Bill Krause's paper because I really want to know is it better to do like a couple of bursts of five minute exercise or do you really have to do an hour? Um, what you have to do is moderate to vigorous exercise. I learned that but it doesn't matter how you do it so you can, you can do it either way. Um, but again these papers reflect the potential for impact among our clinical investigators. Okay, what about resources to support research? Um, very exciting that we are one of 10 institutions in the country that now have the capacity to do cryo-EM. We actually have two facilities. One is at NIEHS that has been up and running, and then one at Duke, which is just starting to be up and running um, already. Some individuals are lobbying for yet another one because apparently this, once you build it, they will come, is really working for our, our cryo-EM. But it also attracts new faculty, which is very evident in the last year. We have a new state-of-the-art proteomics facility and new light microscopy capabilities. So we are leading in, in terms of being able to put big, curated research data sets together. Now look at the complexity of this slide. This is all the types of data sets that you can bring together 
to really ask very deep questions without actually doing randomized clinical trials. There is a lot of information here, and I'm very proud of the fact that we really lead the way both in terms of developing national networks, but also in, in developing our curated data sets. And look at the numbers at the bottom of this slide. We are really making progress. In the last five years, 1.5 million Duke patients have curated data, but in the last year, almost half of them. So we are really on a trajectory. Um, lots more to come there. Okay. What about the opportunities? As you know, we received a letter from NIH in March, not what a new dean wants to get from the NIH, um, with concerns about grant management and oversight of research. And this really related to events that go back as far as 10 years ago, where NIH still was not convinced that we were managing at the level um, that they expect us to. So they put on some new requirements for our management and oversight. NIH approval had to be sought for no-cost extensions and budget carryovers. Normally, institutions have that uh, capability to do that without NIH approval. And we no longer could do modular budgets, that we had to do detailed budgets. Well, we took this all very seriously. And first of all, I want to say thank you for taking it seriously. I certainly did. Um, administrators, faculty, leadership came together, um, talked about uh, the process that we'd have to, to, the pieces that we'd have to put together to really be able to do this efficiently, um, wanting to serve our faculty in a way that they didn't lose um, any time in what they're doing, but also to really meet what conceptually NIH was asking for, which is to show us you can manage this. Um, to date, 27 of the 45 no-cost extension requests have been approved. 18 are still under review, but there are no rejections. So I think we've, we've got this right. We were also asked at the time to send a very comprehensive uh, summary of what our processes are, what our administrative processes are for the grants, uh, but also for misconduct. And a very large uh, piece of work uh, bringing together lots of pieces was submitted April 27th. Um, and NIH took a long time to read it because they were kind of surprised, I think, at how, how, many, how much uh, detail went into this but they responded very positively to our plans for improvement uh, in a letter we received June 13th. So again, thank you, particularly to Scott Gibson, Gita Swamy, who really helped put this all together. So NIH, this is coming from the viewpoint that NIH has a very, very high degree of interest in nationally in scientific integrity, and we're kind of the, the poster child for this. They want institutions to get this right. And that really relates to the open, the Open Science Initiative and data reproducibility. I think you've all seen um, many, many articles that, that talk about the non-reproducibility of scientific data. Um, so we are part of a bigger, uh, a bigger framework that is a national framework, but we want to get this right. Um, our goal is to really lead in data provenance. Uh, so far, I think we're moving in the right direction. We're going to continue to update NIH, and hopefully we will start coming off of some of the requirements that they uh, imposed on us in March. Um, but if you want to find more information about it, we'll keep you updated. But this is part of a Duke-wide research culture initiative. You know, culture is always one of those things that's kind of squishy. Um, but it's really about uh, embedding in everybody the responsibility for the oversight and integrity of the work that we do here, but also giving you the right tools to be able to do that. So it's research administrative processes, it's about data management, ultimately open science. We want to rethink how specific elements of research administration can help you in terms of you being champions of data integrity. Our goal is to facilitate the faculty work and meet the oversight responsibilities, and sometimes it seems like they are at odds, but that is the goal, and to continue to focus ultimately on the quality of the work that we do as part of our scientific culture. So we've been doing a lot in this area, and I think that was really, I, I think, a pleasant surprise when we were able to report a lot of this to NIH. We had already done quite a significant amount of work. Some of the work is through um, offering tools and expertise. So Docker, for instance, went through a massive rollout of a clinical management tool in the last month. I'll tell you how massive that was, called Encore, 
really will improve our ability to track and report. Um, we went through very detailed competency-based job descriptions for our administrators and then providing them the onboarding training and assessment they need to be able to do their jobs. Starting to develop data provenance tools like REDCap and PACE. And then clinical quality monitoring program. This is really focused on monitoring um, investigator-initiated studies that are not industry-sponsored and don't have that oversight in place. We stood up the Advancing Scientific Integri Integrity Services and Training Office to oversee, first of all, the responsible conduct of research. And again, thank you, Gita. This was an amazing um, undertaking. But also to really help our investigators figure out their own needs for data management. And so part of the service this office will, will uh, provide is almost a consultative service, because we know every laboratory, every research group has different needs. We want to enhance the support and training of our research and grant managers and improve research management in general with tools like My Research Home. And then we have an implementation team that really can be mobilized very fast when we need to, like when we needed to respond to NIH. So a lot of work has been done there. The Encore launch, this just gives you a flavor for what anything we do at Duke is about. It's massive. So when you can see we had to migrate over 15,000 protocols, 191,000 patient participants, or 263,000 enroll enrollees. 90% um, 90, 90 of the users had have completed their training. And this is all before the go live date. So a massive undertaking has been done successfully. And now we're going to go start rolling it out um, for phased in for the various CRUs. This is a tool that will enhance our research study management, give us robust reporting capabilities, Enrollment tracking, which is really critical. We, we um, really want to improve the enrollment and then accurate cl clinical research billing. RCR training, same massive undertaking. Uh, mandatory training for all members of our research community, not just pre-docs um, in our PhD programs. So far, we've had almost 5,000 participants. We've offered them a menu of ways to really um, engage, uh, one of which was a, a a um, half a day spent really with our colleagues talking about uh, responsible conduct of research and using our own misconduct cases. As painful as that is, we know in clinical medicine, the way we learn is a case in front of us. Um, and I think that has been a very, very powerful tool. Um, and the programs have been very, very positively uh, reviewed so far. We've gotten 88% of our community that has been that has completed training, um, which is just amazing.